Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Kyle DeQuian. I'm the executive director of the Poetry Project. I'm really so excited and grateful for tonight's reading and, um, and grateful to all of you for joining. I have just a few notes before we get started. I'm joined tonight by my colleagues from the Poetry Project, James Barrickman and Anna Kreinberg, who is sharing a link now to some Zoom FAQs, just in case you do need to acquaint yourself with how this event space works. Um, you are welcome and encouraged to use the chat as a space for talking with one another and expressing appreciation. And while your microphones are off for the time being, everyone will have an option at the end of the event to switch them on. You're also welcome to keep your video camera either on or off. Please just note that this event is being recorded for the Poetry Project's archive. So if your camera is on, your face may be visible at some point in the archived video of this event. In the upper left corner of the Zoom screen, I also want to note that there's a link for a live transcription through Otter AI, in case anyone may appreciate having access to that feature. Um, and Anna is also going to share now our statement of safer space. If you do receive any unwanted private communications in the course of this event, please just chat myself or Anna or James, and we'll get that taken care of right away. If we were gathering tonight, as we have for 55 years in shared place, as well as time, and as we're beginning to do again, we would be in the parish hall of St. Mark's Church. We are committed to continuously and critically engaging the history and future of our presence in this particular space. And as part of that, we would like to acknowledge that our venue as well as the place I'm speaking from tonight is built upon unceded indigenous lands, specifically the territory of the Lenape people. We recognize the continual displacement and violence perpetrated against people of color and indigenous people by the US and are aware that these kinds of acknowledgements can be misused as stand-ins for actual decolonization work, which is something for us to bear in mind as we go forward in our ongoing commitment to accountability, reparation, and equity. We invite you to join us in this work from all of the different places where you are and are sharing another resource in the chat, a map through nativeland.ca, not as an endorsement of this resource's completeness, but as a starting place for those we hope might feel encouraged to consider in new ways the histories of the places where we are. And finally, while we've made all of our online programs free, we've also continued to pay poets and artists for their readings, performances, teaching, and writing. So if you feel moved to offer your support for this work, a link to donate is also going now into the chat. And now I'm going to turn to introducing our first reader tonight, Ari Banyas. I think Many of us who feel called to poetry, whether that's as a reader or a writer or a listener, I think we often experience sense and language as parallel currents. Sometimes those channels cross or they reveal one another or they collaborate to suggest what lands in us as meaning. And there can be a great deal of pain when the relation is unclear that terrain of misfiring speech that goes unuttered. I come back to something resembling equanimity when I read Ari Banyas's work. It is an embodied conceptual response to the forms of the poems, steadiness or a will to continue through a field of irresolution. I don't feel the pressure for language to circumscribe my idea of what an idea is. In the poems, many repetitions, rearrangements, the counterpoints and fulcrums of the line breaks, there is an embrace, an enactment of multiplicity, possibilities, plural and veering dimensions. A Symmetry, his newest book, holds in its title and its manner 
a simultaneity of likeness and tilt. Change reminds us balance is a verb we want so desperately to perceive as noun. The poems are all change, dune-like and shifting in their surfaces, complicating our notions of narrative. Story, person, and place are mutually vulnerable, mutually constituted in their various bearings and transmissions. What is revealed disappears in us and casts its lantern on the horizon. Ari Banyas is a poet living in Oakland. His books are A Symmetry and Anybody, both out from W.W. Norton. And it's a great pleasure now to be welcoming him back to the Poetry Project. Tautology. I had a body and it was good until you gave it meaning. Meaning ruined pleasure and created it. So ruin creates and pleasures meaning I didn't ask for, just lived through. A gate that shrieked each time it opened and on the street we passed one another, flicking our eyes at then away from the bodies made boring by the small clamors that drown out the one large clamor. Something in the tree is arguing with the tree. No, that's just the tree. Um, Kyle, thank you for that um, just really beautiful introduction. Um, I'm so honored to be here reading with Sylvina and reading from this book um, that just came out a month ago. Um, so I'm just gonna keep doing that. And it's just so beautiful to see all of you. Um, three tongues. The first one died licking sand, thinking of the sea split in three. The first a weed resembling whoever's nearest, its medicines camouflaged in mimesis. The second was a bankrupt study abroad program with a sentimental little nationalist streak. A Doric column squatting in a strip mall, the fragrant mountain ringed in cast off first world nouns. That it was written, that it is understood, but how to describe the third? The taste of water? Paradox? The third is using my desire to save from the force of desire, a turquoise burro meant for smashing, I mean to hold. A word that looks at you as if it knows you and you feel warm. The room you back into while staring directly at a light source. So now you twitch without hearing the command to twitch. So that the etymology of the word symmetry is, um, I believe it's from the Greek and it's with measure, symmetria. This poem is called With Measure. And you can't see them, but there are little X's between the phrases that are kind of like dimension, dimension like demarcating dimension. So I'm not, I'm not gonna read the X's out loud. You'll just have to imagine them. With Measure. The sweat, the slabs, the proportions. The sun's calculable angle, hours chiseled. The subtraction of color, bootlicking oaths. Honey, the accents placement, morning clothes. Tired comparisons, the carrying it forward. Centuries balancing it on her heads. The grief sellers, the followers, the rapist minor gods buttery calfskin ripped from its cry, 
aging protégés, soft but not quite pretty enough boys, democracy launderers, shit shovelers, deathless kings, the lips, the pits, tender cunts of every iteration, scouring rags, candle dippers, elastic scrotal skin, bottomless refills, back to normal, the strays cropped out. Clotted tongues, factory farmed embarrassed poets, scale replicas, the package tour, sculpted wastewater channel, hypotenuse, inclusion, inexhaustible lazy olive branch motifs, the pre-recorded oracle, brutality with slicker PR, bacterial feasts, the stream of piss running into the water stream, coercion mistaken for touch, cocksucking for docility, the drape, the folds, didactic plaques, the worship of walls, an exact middle, the reader, the tourist, the sell-by date, detention camp, gag order, garbage strike, the shattered phone, pottery shard, flaming cheese, immortal, ostracized dawn, the width, the length, the weight, pity, hierarchy, calculated exchange, heroic death, a greased loophole, the sucked braid. Contingency. Um, I published this poem um, under the title, When You Look at a Fence, um, which I actually like better. So, when you look at a fence, do you see the fence? When the slats are cut in the shape of a spear or the shape of a new shoot in spring, can you tell the difference? Your mother puts you in that red and white dress, and there are photos of it. Are you inside the fence? When, when she sees her cousin brought to the town square among the dead, stacked in the bed of a wagon, she said. When the frantic hummingbird darts in the field of tinsel and the grapevines shimmering, what is it you see? The surface of the water appears undisturbed when more video evidence is released, a little surveillance device on the seat mouthing off silently. A fraction of you still believe this could change the outcome, that the outcome can seem other than your life, a single night of back-to-back -back reality TV. You feel your atoms go by in the logging truck carrying the strapped down trunks of massive redwoods throttling north. You see a woman bowing over a trash can repeatedly and she looks like she prays to, oh, help her. Who made you think that? If no amount of moving through the world with love, when even armies think themselves beautiful or so you are told, if all the daily errands drown it out, does it have a name? when border agents empty gallons onto the desert floor on camera while smiling, when weighing whether or not to repeat this, what do you consult? Watching red berries on a bush shake and a red robin shit and the red brake lights of a Prius on a turn. When a low plane combs the birds from their treetops, your thoughts scatter to their familiar positions. If numbed now by emphasis, are you inside it? When fisher folk agree to saw their boats in half for a one-time payment, cash. Green opalescent feathers are green opalescent feathers. Artists who design border wall prototypes are artists who say they leave politics out of it. You trace the shape of those words in your mouth. Red tips of matches red tips of drought tolerant succulents, a garden hose coiled on a wooden post continents away, 
You try to separate pain from its subject. You try to separate yourself from its cause while a man in cowboy pants declares the greatness of George Bush. You stack elect electronic gems, one atop the next. And of course he's a donor. By remaining in the building, you become what the building contains. The joint in a polished oak bench, the exhausted cloth applying the polish. When by fucking so hard, you try to make your body reappear. Are you inside the fence when you saw your neighbor keeping her head down and wondered if you should keep your head down? You heard your neighbor screaming in the street and knew you should also scream. Time lapse. The beauty of my home is that it moves, is how the thinking goes. 70 years ago, my grandfather trades a gold bracelet for an egg. A salt particle from the volcanic boulders dissolves, reconstitutes into terraces, footpaths, little heaps of goat turd. This year, fascists ascend the mountains to recruit again from the villages. A lamb will accept even the hardest rind of bread. Do I sing this? Forty years ago, adults dressed me as a cowgirl with a lisp. After they call the cave holy, people throw empty water bottles in it. When the lights go out, the cowgirl and I freed from legibility, stop trying to boil the sadness out of dandelion greens. One coral reef digests its closest neighbor, another coral reef. My post-it notes are getting in the way of me turning the pages. <laughs> okay. Here we go. I didn't I didn't say this before, but I, I kind of um, I'm I'm sure a lot of people in this in this room, Zoom room are, are have been thinking about a Teladnon and um, I just been thinking about her a lot and I just wanted to say that and um, I, I never got to meet her other than on the page but um, yeah I've just been thinking about her so much these last two days so um, these poems are for her I guess right now. Parallelogram. It is easy to use a word like breathtaking to describe the idea but not the feeling of water you don't touch. You stand on a bluff watching cargo ships slide on it. In mid-sized port towns with no tourists, starving cats see it sparkling like this. From the other side of his life, it sparkles next to the cement plant, next to the waste processing facilities. Four kilometers away, a chain of cafes and an uzeri with narrow cane bottom chairs that hurt your ass overlook it. On windy days, the white caps resemble a distant sheep. From the yard, it's new each time she sees it. A phrase at the tip of her mind she meant to say, did she already say like little sheep? But today it sparkles. Until conditions change, it sparkles like this. Officials don't mention it when they cite the bounds of territorial waters to prohibit a rescue boat from docking. In their personal libraries, some of the poetry describes it catching light. 
it is easy to imagine using certain phrases, avoiding others to deflect what doesn't sparkle like this. It is easy to imagine a poem recited at a future occasion in honor of a donor or a dead politician where you can be sure for most angles, the water will. Meander, meandros. This poem, um, the word meander is um, it's the name of a river in what is uh, presently Turkey, the Menderes River. Um, and it's also the name of a design motif that's named after this river. Um, probably most familiar to any New Yorkers on a uh, coffee cup that you get at a deli. Meander, meandros. A law against refugees passed by the children of refugees. Decorative Hellenic borders on deli coffee cups on a silver ring I used to wear. It feels nationalist now. It was always nationalist. Actually, I would say Dawn is fruity, not milky, not gold. What to do with the lie of ethnicity? At dinner, T says, Greece is an invention of the 19th century set on a plinth. Was this green once? Unknown. The cicadas go on. Museum piece. On that part of the island where the ruined tanneries beside the seawall conduct their own inner lives, you tried, like a fetishist of the broken, to photograph the sky through their vacant ceilings, but none of the blue would hold still in its frames while onto the cellophane snack bags blown into corners and a few resplendent sun bleached cans, you projected a prefabricated sorrow, you know better than to say aloud. The blues tirelessness is a selling point, so insistent it scalds, and against all proportion, your dollars materialize another carafe of chilled white, full of undisclosed feeling, crushed in the common barrel and so light on the tongue, you think it faded. That's the kind of lie you like, barely effervescent, unattributed, a note of ache in the semen shot into the dirt outside the discotheque painted tourist pink with a classical name. You gesture again to the filched marble, the headless goddess, dickless youth. They each seem to be you clinging to absence like some backstage pass to the afterlife, not asking how your nose, how your knowledge got that pitch as you ride it down into the guts of the myth, immortal pyramid scheme, still coining itself in your lens, a little shroud made only of sunlight, only of sunlight and the chewed quarter rind of watermelon balanced on a cement post at a construction project paused for mismanagement of funds. And speaking of funds, <clears throat> um, you don't really need to know this about this poem, but um, But I will tell you anyway, which is that um, in the, I think it was in the 80s, the um, EU paid Greek farmers to um, fell their own um, olive trees um, in order to plant something that was more, more profitable. So they were, they were paid incentives to basically um, abandon traditional farming practices. So I started thinking about that when a friend told me that. And, um, and this poem came 
pronoun study. They paid them to cut their olive trees down. You paid them to cut their olive trees down. We paid them to cut their olive trees down. They paid you to cut your olive trees down. We paid you to cut our olive trees down. They paid you to cut their olive trees down. We paid them to cut our olive trees down. They paid us to cut their olive trees down. They paid us to cut your olive trees down. We paid you to cut their olive trees down. We paid them to cut your olive trees down. You paid them to cut our olive trees down. You paid us to cut our olive trees down. We paid you to cut your olive trees down. They paid us to cut our olive trees down. Oracle, this is the opening poem. I'm reading all out of order. It's fun. Oracle. I was wrong. It isn't suffering that's easy, pleasure that's difficult. How is it I've been living this way, holding my piss, a mirror scuffed by distant talk, secretly livid, worried what the dead would think? Someone greets with only the top half of her head, brown curly hair behind a computer monitor. Today for one second, a woman is anyone who has a body and can't forget it. The tight loops of the office carpet start to unhook. Some men are women too. The way a mountain is land and a harbor is land and a parking lot Refuse the difference between sameness and difference. The ocean is on fire, green flame on the neck of a god who is a pile of rocks not apologizing for themselves. Waste. A piece of pleated gold wrapping from a poinsettia in yesterday's downpour, caught and rode the gushing current downhill. It stalled between curb and parked cars, followed by an ebullient orange bounding through the gray, free. The orange exited the narrative. We have more work to do. This morning, the gold thing still hanging around next to a parked car like a big empty flower or a loud hat, lightly stirring, not pinned. I remember two ladies from St. Margaret Mary carrying wilted poinsettias to the trash on a windy day. The gold is joined by a purple ball of tissue resembling one of those horrible plastic shower poofs. Our purpose is not what they told us our purpose is. And I'll close with um, Playa Vista, which is a neighborhood in LA. I even love the gnats was thinking this as I walked through a marsh marked private property, bordered by a six lane road with blocks of new construction, sandy orange, peachish beige condos right in the path of the sunset. Later, I was thinking I even like this long blonde strand of hair here beside the hotel pool caught on a rivet fixed to the plywood lounging platform painted black and faced in wood laminate so as to appear stylish. It's cheap. The wind blows a bit then settles. The hair flails energetically then almost vanishes. I count three separate hairs, each claimed by a different screw. 
A single cloud passes over the sun. From another vantage, the cloud would be elsewhere. Gnats and birdsong ecstatic in the reeds, the lit up LA fitness sign reflected in the marsh water white on liquid pink. A duck paddles across and the letters smear. Last finds, facile nest, faint less. It can be some other way and is. Thank you so much. Um, and I can't wait to hear you, Selena. Thank you, Ari. Thank you so much. Um, it was amazing to hear those poems in air. Um, and and it, it really made me feel that something I love so much about your book and about this most recent book of Sylvina's that I've read is the ways the two of you are writing and thinking about carrying stories across place and the ways that stories and place interact and the ways that language can take apart our ideas of what stories are and what places are. Um, so I'm excited to, to hear Sylvina read shortly. And now I will turn to that introduction. Um, if you cut a square in half and you cut that half in half and you keep reducing the object of focus infinitesimally. That's how I think of memory. And it's close to the experience I have of reading Silvina Lopez Medin's work, Poem That Never Ends. The lyric architecture is accumulating precision. And at the same time, the horizontal aperture narrows, foreshortening into a sort of telescope. A new dimension keeps occurring. And the work makes of language a fabric to approach perceiving. Everything immaterial of memory that absorbs and eludes us, how does it become a geography? Even without artifacts or logic, the past holds us in some kind of perpetual somnambulism, a state of dreaming, going, recurring deja vu. In its surfaces and textures, Silvina Lopez Medin's work, Poem That Never Ends, is highly material. We are located in dates, documents, photographs, scenic transcriptions. But the endlessness of this work, I think, is in its insistent vapor. There is something of history and record wandering in aporia. And the elements hold me as a reader, as memory does, the sense of memory that feeling simultaneously magnetized and dislocated that keeps the compass spinning. Silvina Lopez Medin was born in Buenos Aires and lives in New York. Her books of poetry include Excursion, which received the Oversound Chapbook Prize, and That Salt on the Tongue to Say Mangrove, translated by Jasmine V. Bailey and published with Carnegie Mellon University Press. Her hybrid book, Poem That Never Ends, was a winner of the Essay Press University of Washington Bothell Contest. She co-translated Ann Carson's Eros the Bittersweet into Spanish. Her writing has appeared in Plowshares, Hyperallergic, The Brooklyn Rail, Harriet, The Poetry Foundation, and MoMA Post, among others. She's an editor at Ugly Duckling Press, and I'm so excited to be welcoming her to the Poetry Project. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Kyle, for the introduction and for the invitation and Ari for this uh, beautiful, beautiful reading, really. It's a pleasure to be sharing it with you. Uh, so I'm going to share screen. Um, Okay. And I'm going to be reading to, from this book that uh, Kyle talked about so kindly. <clears throat> the sound of blinds being pulled up is the first sound. It's in your hands, 
the weight of the slats, all slightly bent to one side, as someone that bends with their ear towards the other, trying to hear more. What? Your grandmother, like your mother, could only hear 30% of all things. You cross out the word grandmother. You'll say your mother's mother. You'd rather have the word repeated, mother. Build a chain with no missing ring. You're not pulling yet, but it's in your hands, the chain that raises the metal slats. You hear what your mother's mother wouldn't hear, the slats clattering. She, who used to leap between blades, her scissors silent to her, opening and closing on the clothes, cutting, cutting, until what? Until she reached an edge, a pair of eyes looking at her from the other side of the sewing table, her daughter herself a table, not flat, not smooth, the top filled with pieces of broken wood, broken, can stick in your skin, a daughter, a table made of broken things, but varnished, protected, sorry, I have to, uh, sorry, a table made of broken things, but varnished, protected, protective like the blinds you're not yet pulling, to open and close, to cut until, to look up and see someone, not knowing what to do with the weight of a stair or top of the table, sharp points that don't hurt, but shine, shine, varnished, to separate the cloth just cut into pieces. This is not your daughter, this is not you, and yet you are a mother. She's your mother's mother, you're pulling. I asked my mother to send me the letters that her mother used to send her from Paraguay, where my mother was born, to Argentina, where she moved at 19, where I was born. I estimate she must have received around 126 letters from her mother during her lifetime. Each time she received a letter, she would read it once and then rip it into pieces. She was able to send me only two of her mother's letters. The two letters that she kept were the ones in which, among the usual comments her mother made about her work as a seamstress, she speaks about life, she speaks about death. One letter is from 1980, the year my brother was born, the year before my mother's father died. Her mother abandoned her for three years, from the time she was three years old until she was six, my mother lived with her aunts in a town called Piribebuy, 72 kilometers from Asuncion, the capital city, 72 kilometers from her daughter. During those three years, she was never visited. My mother never talks about that. Piribebuy in Guarani means shiver or soft breeze. It rises from the scene, shoots out of it like an arrow and pierces me, says Roland Barthes about the central element in photographs. He ends up calling it punctum, but I keep the first name he gives it. What is the wound, mother, in this photograph? A question I can think about, not ask. The image my mother captured with her phone, the photograph of the photograph, like a memory retold, is that the wound? What's lost between the original print version and my mother's digital one? Some resolution, some precision. The original is on an upper shelf, deep in a box whose lid my mother needs to lift. She needs to get a ladder first, lean it against the wall, stretch her long arms all the way back there so she cannot reach again now, she says, the original. When I zoom it in on this digital version, it's hard to see any details. So dark the background, it gives no indication of place. And then it rises from the scene, shoots out of it like an arrow and pierces me. The flash, bouncing off my father's glasses. That light signals what the photographer, my father's mother was looking at her son's eyes, mother, flash, son, the glass that's always in between.
I gave myself permission to sit each day and write, says a poet who just published her first novel. Night, bar, a glass in my hand, two glasses, one in each of her hands, like someone who wears two watches so as not to lose the slightest track. I bend towards her ear, speak. She bends towards my ear, speaks. A rhythm that's outside the rhythm that flows out of invisible loudspeakers. Our glasses are empty and we keep holding them. How did you move to the narrative side of things long enough for a novel to spread, I spill. Here my voice is a whisper. Somewhere else would be a shout. It's me speaking and it's my mother who still can't figure why I can't write poems long enough to blend into something else. She has stopped talking into my ear, the writer. So now I can't hear her. Like my mother, I have to read her lips in order to make out how she made it, how writing is a thing unfolding, and I can't, I can't make it out. You will not look straight at the camera except when you are told to do so. You will forget. You will forget. You will forget that this is you. I think it can be done. You will also forget about the camera, but above all, you will forget that this is you. You. Yes. I think it's possible to achieve that from other perspectives. For instance, the perspective of motherhood, of your motherhood lost in a dominant, nameless motherhood. The opening of Marguerite Duras's film, The Atlantic Man, I replace the word death with motherhood. You chose to write precisely what I like less, poetry and theater, said my mother years ago. I put the airplane seat straight up, opened the tray table, my journal on it. Is this poetry? How do you exit such a line, dead end? If you hit it, hit it again, write it down, someone said. Is this poetry? When you have hearing loss, there's a blurred line between statements and questions. When my mother was a child, her aunt would take her to the theater. She would be lost among words she could not grasp, would not look at the stage, but stare at the closest exit. Is what you're writing now poetry, she soon might ask. I turn the pages in my journal until I find a quote in a nearby entry. Lyric was from its inception, a term used to describe a music that could no longer be heard. A metallic sound precedes the voice on the loudspeaker. We have begun our descent. Stow your tray table, pass any remaining service items and wanted reading materials to the flight attendant. I am writing this in my head my hands inside gloves that don't match. I lose at least one from the pair per season and hold on to the other. That single glove left behind still contains the lost one. That is to say, on the winter break, I read Pascal Quignard. In every image, there's a missing image, says he. I add, in every sound, there's a missing sound say, my mother, how she, because of her hearing impairment, is permanently reconstructing sentences from fragments. Isn't that writing? I am walking nine blocks back home from the subway. It is minus 18 degrees, and I'll never know how to turn that into Fahrenheit, or how, at times, I focus on something so much as to become something else, gloves, prevent us from breaking apart. Gloves are not relevant in Buenos Aires. This cold does not exist. 
the kind that makes you turn not only your head, but your whole body, just to look at what's coming. I did not write much back there, just brought a couple of summer images, my mother and I at night standing in front of a white wall, killing mosquitoes. My mother, my sons, I in the backyard, hurrying to take away the clothes from the clothes line and the light rain. My watch does not understand the instability of February. It keeps going. As if today were the 29th, it says 29. So I have to change it manually, pull the crown, push it in, pull again until what's hardest to find, the middle position, then rotate to the correct date, one. March begins. March is the month in my mother's mother letter, one of the two my mother kept. The one written in red ink, March 1980, the date is uncertain, looks like a nine on top of a five or vice versa. As I stir, it changes from one to the other and back, so it still moves. 39 years later, her hesitation exists, a four day crack, like the vertical line that marks where the paper was folded, a line that pushes words apart, I write at least, we are doing well, recovering quite well. In this letter, my mother's mother writes as if she were trying to catch her breath while, like my watch, she keeps going. She uses no period for almost the entire page. For who would they dare stop her? She says, your father. She says, his surgery. She says, complication twice. Not as a fact, but as something to chase away. She goes on talking about my mother's soon-to-come son. She says, we might be able to travel, then leaves the uncertainty behind. We'll be expecting your phone call. I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you. I see her, her body bent over the page that lies on her sewing table, red pen in him, the same determined posture she had when mopping the floor in the middle of the night, the whole night, back forth, back forth, the distorted echo of a faraway dance beyond any remnant of past, any crease or crack in time, her grandson born days later, her husband until the next year alive. <clears throat> La Memoria de un Sonido is the name of an old literary magazine my friend lends me. The Memory of a Sound. First issue of the two it lasted. Just two, like a direct sound and its reflection. Waves crashing against walls or child running into a mother's hard lap. When you first realize that your parents are as abandoned as yourself, you are filled with terror. You start asking yourself, who's the caregiver here? Says Argentine filmmaker Lucrecia Martel in an interview in the magazine. Scene, exterior, day, veranda in Buenos Aires, February 2012. My mother and I sitting on a sofa facing forward. She's talking about her eldest brother who recently died in a car accident. Those years, my mother left me with my aunts. He was the only one that visited me. She sobs. She split in half. She's at her aunt's house with her brother. She's here on the veranda with me. I cannot hold the pieces. We are facing forward. I cannot turn around. The sofa fabric is plastic, rigid. I can feel its pattern marking the backs of our thighs. It was on February 21, 2012, almost one year since the birth of my eldest son. The phone rang, it was my mother's voice saying, Enrique is dead, a bus ran over him. He did not hear the horn, no introduction, no details, no real conclusion, a chain of facts broken, this is scattered. 
My uncle's hearing impairment was more severe than my mother's. It was hard for him to articulate most sounds. It was sometimes hard for us to understand, not him, but the words coming from him. Yet he insisted. He did not mind parting words, repeating, asking back. Words would become more material. We could almost touch them. In the interview, Martel goes on to speak about speech and time. When someone talks, they may use verbs in the present, past, or future tense. This temporary, temporal quality of words dissolves the idea of consecutive chronological flow. In this photo, there is a sepia layer of my mother and her brother in the 1950s, sitting close, though not holding each other. And then there is a red spot, the present tense of my mother's nail polish, her fingers holding her phone to take a photo of the photo, her fingers holding themselves. Who's a caregiver here? I must have thought sitting on the sofa on the veranda by my mother. I must have gotten lost in the thought, unable to act. I wrote a poem about it, a piece left out of some past book. I won't translate it from my native language, so you can at least read this, mother. Siesta. Nos dábamos la espalda. Ese sonido ahogado, madre, ¿qué era? Por primera vez te escuchaba llorar. Me quedé quieta, apreté la almohada contra la oreja, la almohada con el olor de tu pelo. No pregunté, no me di vuelta, esperé que pasara, pero crecía tu llanto entre las dos. Hicimos lo que pudimos, quedarnos cada una en su lugar, y en algún momento dormirnos. I'm going to read the, the last poem, which gives title to the book. Poem that never ends. Mama is in bed, eyes wide open. She doesn't turn on the light. Mama at midnight cleans the floor with the cloth over and over. Mama paints a picture that looks like another one. She breaks three brushes, not scared of splinters. Mama is a daughter, a diminutive one, in the back seat of a car. Her mother's taking her away, away from her. Mama at the door, staring at the red scarf on her mother's neck. Mama writes an entire page to the teacher, words lean forward as if towards something they're trying to touch. Mama writes, Mama is a teacher. Mama places a pattern on a piece of cloth, cuts around it, cuts a circle on her skin. The scar is a spider. Mama spins her own cloth, scissors on the side. Mama turns bangs into a crooked hem. Mama teaches me how to draw trees that bend, pretending movement. Mama, wound, breath, breeze. Mama demands stillness, carries on her neck the weight of a camera. Mama has lost the voices of birds. Mama, silence so still, as if she's about to have her photo taken. Mama got lost under a table. She moves around the living room. Lights turn themselves on over her. Mama waits in the line that surrounds the dance school. Her father's body blocks the door. Mama draws her family on a paper. She's the tallest one, so tall, her head goes out of the page. Mama draws all the family except herself. Mama paints a self-portrait. Everything is a self-portrait she gets tired of. Mama transports words to another tongue. Mama changes her own words. Mama bites her tongue so many times, so afraid to lose it. 
Mama is afraid to lose it all. Mama is a tongue. She splits herself in half because she wants to. Mama sits on top of someone else. She sways, she expands like a drop of ink in a piece of cloth. Mama closes her eyes, makes up a prayer to put herself to sleep. Mama is sinking. No one warns her of full stuckness. Mama wakes up dead. Mama comes from a land surrounded by more land, comes on the lowest part of a boat below waterline. She sees fish she doesn't see. Mama in the ocean with needles on her belly. Mama is a mother. Mama is a mother. Mama keeps a bit of a song she doesn't know. Mama hugs me and there is always between us a cushion or a stone. Mama in summer sleeps in a night cone soaked in bathtub water. Mama wants to return to that summer. Mama wants to turn around. Mama on her belly on the sand closed tight like an eyelid. Her face to the sun, to the sun, to the sun. Mama stays, she asks how much longer. Mama has lost another sound, she insists how much longer. Mama paints on top pages. Mama walks barefoot and steps on the body of a bee. Mama reads other people's mouths. Mama lights a fire and places us on top of it. She sings a song that escapes her. Mama lights a fire, places us around it in winter, paints our names with ashes. Mama lights up. Mama takes us by the hands. Let's go for hands. Mama asks our names. Mama sees everything, hears everything, remembers everything. Mama jumps across a paddle that's longer than her legs. Mama, from where to where? Mama, our shoelaces keep coming untied. We keep falling. Mama splits herself in half. She squeezes her mother's red scarf. Mama wakes up to feed us every night. Mama doesn't sleep anymore. Mama sleeps all the time. Mama is floating. Mama is sinking. Mama swings to no shore. Mama carries us on her back. Mama cannot see us. Mama sees everything. Mama squeezes a scarf, squeezes her hands. How much longer? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sylvina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, um, wow, both of these books are such full, I mean, they're just complete and so exciting and thrilling as, as Book Wink works. Um, and it's great to hear both of you read. So thank you again to Ari. Thank you to Sylvina. Thank you to everyone listening. Um, the last thing that I want to mention is that uh, our next two events are lectures. On November 18th, we have Johan Mihail reading or lecturing as part of uh, a keynote for one of our curatorial fellows. And then on December 2nd, we have Dean Spade delivering a lecture, The Revolution is My Person Friend, Dismantling the Romance Myth. Um, so we hope to have you with us for either of those events or something else in the future. And now we invite anyone who wants to, to switch on their microphone. And if you'd like to say hello or thank you or just talk with one another, we'll leave the Zoom open for maybe five minutes or so. Yeah, hi, thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, Gazal. <laughs> Good to see you. Fantastic uh, reading. Thank you. And Sylvina, that was so incredible. I cannot wait to read your book. I cannot wait to have it in my hands. It's just so you cool. Ari, I, I love your reading too, really. I, I really felt it. Thank you. So good night to everyone. It's pretty late here. <laughs> good night, Kazal. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Ari. 
Hey guys, thanks for Hi. coming. So good to see you. Oh, so good to see you too. Everyone's so sweet and shy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which I always wish I also would be if I was on the other side. So I, <laughs> we will also uh, download the chat and send you these. Oh, that's awesome. In case Thank you, you missed any. Yeah. Well, it's just a 16 now. Anyone want to say anything? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. Yeah. Um, really. And yeah, yeah, really. I really enjoyed the reading. I didn't get a chance to say thank you to like all the staff of, of Poetry Project because I was so like moved by your intro, Kyle. But like, thank you to everyone who who worked on this event. Yeah, it's so wonderful to work with James. And I don't know if Anna's still in the room, but um, just a real dream team. Um, I think I'm feeling like this is the end of our night but I'm so appreciative to have heard both of these readings and I can't wait to follow everything else that you all share subsequently. So, good thank night. Thank you again, Kyle, and thank you, Kyle. Thank you so much, Sylvina. Um, okay, I'll look for you. Beautiful night. Likewise, <laughs> likewise. Have a beautiful good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>